And today we are pleased to welcome Dr. Jesse Poland, a very special guest from Kansas State University. Um, Dr. Poland is assistant professor at Kansas State University and he serves as research center and he is also the director of the Feed for the Future Innovation. Weed breeding with um, genomic selection. So, with that, I hope we all can like enjoy his talk and everything. And we welcome Dr. Jesse Poyan. Thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the students for the nice invitation to come and join. I always get invited to speak at the Kansas State Symposium, but about 75% of the selection committee of students there are my own students. So it doesn't mean too much, but the And so I'm going to talk today about some of our work, uh, working to implement genomic selection. We work with a number of breeding programs around the country, around the world. This work is focused on the CIMIT um, breeding program, which is the International Wheat Research Center located in Mexico, with mostly focus in uh, sub uh, South Asia, uh, major wheat growing regions of the world. And so uh, here, here on the left is uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug, hopefully familiar to everyone. And then here on the right is Watson. And so think about how can we take what Dr. Borlaug established and put some supercomputing power behind it in the future. So I always start with this, thinking about the breeding cycle. And it's this iterative process, advanced cycle breeding, of taking and making crosses, some new genetic variation, uh, pushing those through evaluation, and then selecting the best and putting those back into the crossing block. And so in reality, this is like a five to 10 or 15 year process. And so how do we make this go faster? Also, it's a very expensive process. And this line going from crossing to evaluation is costing thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars for a typical program. And so in the, in the, in the CIMIT program, it's something where we start with selected bulk populations. Those go to small plot testing. So the first year kind of small plot trials that go out, there's about 30,000 to 50,000 plots. And then about 10,000 of those go into, into like what's first year yield testing, and so those are 10,000 entries, and those go in one location, uh, one or two replications. And then about 1,000 of those get advanced to advanced yield trials, so those go to multiple environments and three replications. And then a subset of those go to what, what's well recognized, the international nurseries, and so these are disseminated to hundreds of countries around the world. Um, and 
and hundreds of, of programs all over the world take this germplasm, and then this is a lot of the germplasm base uh, for the developing world. And then if all goes well, you might, after 10 to 15 years, get one new variety out of that process. So it's a question of how do we make this go bigger and faster. So um, back to think about this and accelerating the breeding process. I also always like to show the, the breeders fit. This is in the breeders equation, but it's their favorite equation because uh, this is the gain per unit time. And so this is, this is a function of the selection intensity, uh, the selection accuracy, uh, the, the genetic variance or the, the um, function of the additive genetic variance, and then the years per cycle. So with all of these, we obviously want to increase the selection intensity. And so you can increase it to a limit. Obviously, if you increase too much, you're going to limit your genetic diversity going into the next cycle. And then also that's a decreasing returns. And so if you double your selection intensity, you don't actually double your expected rate of gain. So, but we do need bigger populations and that's a given. Uh, so the selection accuracy, we obviously want to increase this. So this is more precise measurements, reducing errors, correcting for environments. So all the approaches, replication, uh, somehow whatever you can do to increase your heritability on your trait of interest. Uh, then we look at the genetic variance. And so to maintain this or to increase it, so this is a mixed bag. Um, I think it's Halauer who's famous for saying that 99% that of genetic variance is bad. Uh, but, but basically, you want to you want to increase genetic variance, but you don't want all the junk. So, um, so you have to maintain genetic variance. And I'll talk about this today. But there's a lot of interesting approaches with the genomic selection that you can select the right combinations of parents to actually maximize the variance in the progeny. Uh, and then years per cycle. I think this is one of the biggest ones where genomic selection and predictions can make a difference. Is that you need to this is the one you want to decrease, and this is a big one because it's a constant rate of return. So if you do if you do cut in half the years per cycle, then you have an expected doubling in the rate of genetic gain. So these are all the ones we're, we're talking about. Mostly with genomic selection, we're talking about increasing the selection intensity because we can do bigger populations. Now, we're not really talking about selection accuracy, but we're talking about years per cycle and decreasing those. So most of the day when we talk about this, we we'll, we'll be looking at, at those two things. So just in the simplest way, we, we always remember the genomic selection is just using the, the um, dense genome-wide markers to predict the to total genetic value. And so in the simplest form, this is just estimating kinship um, between uh, individuals with those markers and the realized relationship. So uh, you can always estimate the expected relationships uh, based on the pedigree, and then you have limitations on that because you have full sibs that are the expected same. So we know this well. If you start on the one hand side and, and you have sets of twins that have identical genetics and identical pedigrees, you expect them to look the same. In the middle is a group of siblings where uh, on, the, on, a, on an additive kinship basis, you'd expect them to look the same, but you know that your brother as you know, the weird one, it doesn't quite look like you. And so that's the Mendelian segregation that we try and capture uh, with the markers. And then you move more distant to that, like cousins and, and, and less, less related individuals. And you try and capture that Mendelian segregation that differs from what's expected by pedigree. So we work a lot with the Simit um, bread wheat breeding program. This is the program led by uh, Robbie Singh uh, there in, in, in Mexico. The main site is at uh, Obregon. And, and then, so this data set that we're working with comes from the advanced yield trials. These, we have six years uh, in this study so far. And this is focused, so what I'll be talking about is is the um, quality data. So these are the wheat quality phenotypes I'll introduce on the next slide. But these, these phenotypes only have one rep per year, primarily because they take a lot of seed and they're quite expensive. Uh, but that aside, we can actually start to accumulate a pretty large set of data over many years. And so here's the numbers. 
Uh, you can see that each year, like I pointed out uh, in, in that previous slide, there's, a, there's, there's close to nine to 10,000 that go into the yield trials every year. A much smaller set of those are selected based on yield and agronomics and then go to the quality testing lab. And so that's the number on the right hand side uh, showing the number that we have data for quality phenotypes and then we have data uh, on the markers for all of this entire set. So some of the phenotypes we look at from the quality lab, um, these are grain characteristics, so thousand kernel weight, also test weight, uh, protein content, hardness, and pretty typical traits for a wheat, uh, bread wheat breeding program, and some of the milling traits and flour protein, flour yield, and then we also look at, at dough and baking traits. And so you have mixograph and alleviograph. And so these are actually traits where you mill the sample, uh, you form up the dough, and then you see what kind of strength and how long it takes to mix it and the optimal mixing properties. And so these are all really critical traits, especially for raised uh, breads. And then the final uh, trait for, for a wheat quality phenotype, at least in a hard wheat program, is is this loaf volume so actually what kind and quality of raised raised loaf of bread you get and so you can imagine these are relatively expensive uh, low throughput uh, uh, difficult traits to measure and so to think about like a data point each loaf of bread is like one data point okay so Obviously, these wheat quality phenotypes are a nice target for genomic selection. One, because they're expensive, we can easily generate genetic markers that are less expensive uh, than, than, than this phenotype. And two, we can potentially do much, much more genotyping than we can put samples through the quality lab. So with that, I'll just jump into what we uh, look at for prediction accuracies. So what we're showing here is actually forward predictions. And so we take the data from all of the previous years, just as you would do in a breeding program, you take all of your data that you've generated and then predict into the next year. And so you can see in each one of these panels, some of them we didn't have early years of data, and so the predictions only start in later years. Um, but we have the thousand kernel weight and the top thousand kernel weight and test weight and create hardness. You can see varying levels, this general trend. Uh, a couple of things I wanna point out, there's a general trend as we increase the data. And remember, this is going from, in the first year, we had about 500 lines that were in the training population. By the time we reach the uh, last year, we're up to over 4,000 uh, lines that are in the training population. So this idea that having a large and really large training population is very important uh, for, for getting good predictions. And we can see that the predictions go up and up each year. Also, we can see that it seems to like level off in most of these traits. And so I think then we actually start to approach the heritability of many of these traits. And so that becomes our upper potential uh, for, the, for the prediction accuracy. Uh, the other thing to point out is that, that these different colored lines, we have like a lactic net and Gaussian kernel, partial least square random forest, all of these different models that are represented by the different lines. Uh, as you can see in most of those, that there's not much different in the different prediction models. And so as many, many genomic selection studies find that the type of model, at least in my mind, doesn't seem to make much different. It's all about the, how good the phenotypes are and how big the training population is. And, and, then, uh, and then the different models are, are pretty minor differences. And so you can see for most of these, we've got good prediction accuracy. Some of them like grain hardness, you actually have quite low uh, prediction accuracy. Uh, reaches only to about 0.3. Some of that's expected as many of these are already selected to be um, quite hard. And so there's limited genetic variation uh, in the breeding program to start with. Surprisingly, some of these traits like flower yield, uh, you have quite good predictions across the way. And so I'll just move on here. And here's the second set of, of quality traits. And these are the ones that are really interesting because these are the uh, very difficult and expensive ones. So like on the bottom here, we have a graph. W and alleviograph uh, P over L, which are two of the parameters based on you form this you form this ball of dough and you basically blow it up with air and then you see how fast how big and how fast it contracts and so you can imagine this is like a 
pretty difficult phenotype. And so to say that we can get a prediction accuracy of like 0 0.5, so this is the correlation between the observed and the predicted, uh, in my mind, is really good. And then finally here, we get prediction accuracies for low volume that are up around 0 0.5, and we have this full data set. So overall, this is, this, in my mind, I always have to stop and say like, wow, we can like predict how large a loaf of bread we're gonna make out of this, this wheat variety. And, and so um, that's the overall findings of our prediction models. And so what we can do then is we kind of took this and we said, well, what, what kind of expected gains could we get here? And so really, if you're if in, in the purely classical quantitative genetic sense, if we're doing genomic selection, even though it's direct selection on the genomics, on the genetics, it's, it's really an indirect selection on the phenotype. And so uh, we took, so, so here, on the, here on the left is the, is the classical equation for, for gain from indirect selection. And so you have your square root of the heritability for, your, for y, which is the indirect selected trait, and x, which is your, your target trait. And then you have the um, additive, uh, the, the, the correlation on the additive. Um, and then you have the selection intensity for both of those. And so obviously, if you have a decent correlation between the traits and you have a much higher selection intensity uh, for the indirect selection, then you actually have potential to have better gain from indirect selection than you would, than you would have directly selecting on a trait. So in the real world, this doesn't happen too often. But what we can do now with genomics is we can actually have much, much larger population sizes. And so to actually get an assessment of this, uh, we took this equation and, and switched it around a little bit. So the intermediate step here in, in the bottom is because we don't actually observe the, the, um, the additive genetic correlation. And, um, and so what we have here on the bottom in, the, in this intermediate step is that we have, we have this um, phenotypic correlation. Is, is a function of the square root of the heritabilities and, and the additive um, correlation. And so then if you, if you substitute these all around, then you can get this form on the right, which is, which is uh, kind of an approximation of what we're, what we're looking at with the genomic selection. And so you, then, then what we have here is that we have the ratio of, of, of what I'm trying to say is, is the genomic selection versus the phenotypic selection is then a function of the, uh, here again, the same thing, the, the selection intensity that we can apply with genomics versus the selection intensity we can apply with the phenotypic selection on the bottom. It's the correlation between the phenotype and the genomic prediction, which is something that we observe. We can, we can measure that. And then it's the, it's the, it's the heritability of the, the phenotypic trait, which is something we can also observe. So we can calculate, on the right-hand side, we can calculate all of this uh, based on our study. So here's the notes to, to, to actually say what we're able to do is that we select about 1,000. So this is trying to accurately represent the, the current SIMIT program. So we select about 1,000. That's, that's sort of the capacity of what can go into the quality lab. And actually, it's, it's a bit less than 1,000. And so we can do this from, from the phenotype of 2,000. And so, so here again, this would be the assumption that we're actually doing quality phenotypes on 2,000 lines, which is beyond the current capacity. Um, so this is kind of overestimating what we'd actually be able to phenotype. Uh, but we'd say we, we, we were able to do quality phenotypes on 2,000, or we can genotype 10,000, which is, which is what we're actually doing in the SIMIT program right now. And I roughly estimate that these are going to be about the same cost. It's probably actually going to be more expensive to do the quality phenotypes at about $100 per sample uh, versus the, the genotyping here is running about $10 to $15 per sample. So we can estimate heritability for each one of these traits. Um, oh, let me back up. So then again, if we're selecting 1,000, we obviously have a 50% selection intensity uh, with phenotypic selection and a 10% selection intensity that we could apply with genomic selection. And uh, so I think if, if you look at many wheat breeding programs, this would be a pretty accurate assessment of the kind of selection intensity that they're able to apply uh, for quality phenotypes just based on the number of quality phenotypes that they can generate each year. So then we have heritability estimated for each trait, and then we also have the observed uh, correlation between the phenotype and the genotype because we, uh, we benchmark these across years. So what we get then if, is, if, is if we um, calculate these all out, you can see on the left-hand side here the traits um, and then the heritability estimates for each one of those across years. I, um, I do have to give the caveat that these were heritability estimates based on the, the 
the genomic additive matrix just because we didn't have replications. And so here again, those are, those are um, what, what we estimate, but they're pretty well in line with, with other observations at the SIMIT program. Then we have the, the, uh, cor the correlation between the, the, um, the phenotype and the genomic prediction. And so that's the second column there. And so you can see here again that those were all the forward predictions. Those are the correlations we observed in, in the last two years. And so, like I said, the, the low volume down at the bottom there is about a 0.5. So then if you calculate this out and you, take, you calculate that ratio of the CR, which is the indirect selection, to the, to the R, which is the direct selection, you get, you get numbers that vary from about one and a half to, to two. So we're basically hitting like a two-fold selection uh, increase by, by being able to do the genomic selection. And so overall, this here again, is partly a function of decent prediction accuracies, but it's more a function of being able to do five to 10 times more genomic samples than we're able to do quality phenotypes. Okay? So that's the overall conclusion. So there's a couple caveats that, that, that I always like to, to have. And so I had this in a previous talk, and I wanted to, I thought it, since, since they gave me like 40 minutes or something, I could put like some extra slides in here. Um, and so, uh, so what we got here is doubling rate of gain, and then there's a couple caveats, okay? So you kind of heard the backstop of we've got several thousand lines in this program, and the heritabilities are quite good. And so the things to remember is that, that you can't put the, the cart in front of the horse, so this is uh, take-home message number one, meaning that uh, if you don't have a good quality, quality phenotypes for quality, right? If you don't have quality phenotypes in your program, if you don't have good phenotypes in the program coming in with good heritability, uh, putting genomic markers on this is, is not, not going to help at all because we've validated this second uh, take home. We've validated this many times in our program also that if you have these models and you put garbage in, you get garbage out. And so if you have a zero heritability trait, uh, you can't really improve that with, with genetic markers. And so I get a lot of people that come and say, oh, I've, got this, I've got this training population of, of 65 individuals and my heritability is 0.1. You think it will help if we put uh, markers on this and, and do some genomic predictions? And yeah, pretty much no. So, uh, so these are some things to think about. And so, so this is to step back and say, okay, so we're able to like take these genomics and, and rapidly uh, accelerate the, the breeding process, but this is based on a foundation of some pretty key principles. And so, I'm take a step back then and think about a genomic selection and, and this phenotyping. So these aren't new concepts, and, and we didn't invent this gain from selection uh, equation with, with the genomics era, right? This is from Falconer McKay, and this is, this, is, this is for the past century. Breeders have been doing this. And so going back to Dr. Borlaug and thinking about the original genotyping by uh, GBS, which is the genotyping by seeing, this is one of the... Uh, the breeders at Punjab Ag University keyed me onto this. And so this idea that we put, it, we put stuff in the field to observe the underlying genetics, and then you use the heritability to, to see how accurate you are at selecting those genetics. Okay, so this is Borlaug's favorite equation too, and you can see how these things would be implemented in the CIMIT breeding program uh, for the last 50 years, ever since that program was established. And so one of the biggest thing was this selection intensity. So this program over the years, and you look at any commercial program too, there's just this steady ramp up of increasing the population sizes year after year. So they've got huge F2 populations. The selected bulks are literally millions of plants. Uh, big screening nurseries, there's thousands and thousands that go into replicated testing every year. Okay, and so this really increased the selection intensity over the past few decades. This is, this is without genomics, of course, right? So the next one is the selection accuracy, and this comes from all those replicated testings. And these international nurseries literally go out to hundreds of locations every year. So you talk about being able to, like, separate the noise from the, from the genetics from the noise and uh, to be able to do this. So, so when you look at these trials and you have heritability on yield of, like, 0.8, well, you can do a pretty good job of selecting on yield, and you can also do a pretty good job of training these prediction models because the phenotypes are so good. And this is a function of that, that, that really good testing, really good environments, and a good selection accuracy. So the other big one is genetic variance. I haven't talked about this at all today, but 
Uh, just to note that Dr. Borlaug did a lot to bring new variation into the breeding program with like the semi-dwarfs and, the, and the, the stem rust resistance. And then the biggest one too was, was doing the shuttle breeding program. So this is the same thing. So with the genomics, we can select earlier in the process. They also did this by accelerating the breeding program to do more generations per year. So remember, this isn't the number of uh, this isn't the number of uh, generations per cycle, but it's the number of years per cycle. So if you can run more generations per year, then you have the same gain. So Dr. Borlaug did this, and it was really fundamental in in um, in, in, in accelerating the summit breeding program. And so overall, these aren't, these aren't any new concepts. We just can do this with genomics. We have some new tools, uh, just like have been implemented in, in most of the commercial breeding programs. Uh, new uh, new field, field breeding tools. Now we can layer down here in the bottom, we can layer genomics on it. So overall, where we're at, and uh, particularly with this quality, you look at this originally, we were, we were at this stage of, of having maybe a thousand um, breeding lines to look at to, to potentially make selections on quality for advancing back into the crossing block. And so basically we can do this one or two years earlier and we can, we can do this from 10 times more breeding lines potentially selected for quality. And so then you put all of this together and you have a much larger potential gain um, from selection. And so this is where we're at with the CIMIT program. We're doing many of the same things for agronomics and disease traits and yield uh, particularly. And so to think about the future is how can we put all this together? Uh, this becomes really computationally heavy, uh, partly data management, but then also we're using like pretty simple, pretty vanilla flavor uh, prediction models. And so like I said, you didn't see much change, you didn't see much increase with the different prediction models. And so how can we take some biological priors, some biological information and actually build some informed models? Also think about how can we layer high throughput phenotyping data on top of this. And so Jared from my group's got to talk later uh, to, to think about how do we start to layer all these pieces of information together and a computational framework to actually do a much better job of predicting across environments. So with that, uh, I'll just end there. Got a great group at Kansas State, also a really great group of collaborators in the SIMA program. Need to recognize Ravi Singh, who runs the, the wheat program there at CIMIT, and Suzanne, who runs the marker lab, as our collaborator on that. Carlos uh, runs the uh, wheat quality group at CIMIT, and so a lot of this information came out of his group. And then in my group, Shuang Ye runs the runs the uh, GBS marker lab to generate all these genotypes. And Sarah Battenfield at the bottom, she's done a lot of this um, analysis. And so I need to recognize her along with Jessica, who's at, uh, with Cornell, but at the center program now. So uh, this, is our, uh, this work is supported by, uh, largely by USAID uh, with the Feed the Future Innovation Lab. And so just another advertisement, Sarah's moving on to a hybrid wheat breeding position. And so we're continuing this work and we'll look, be looking for a good postdoc and quantitative genetics in the next couple months. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Jesse Poland. Uh, now he is ready to take questions. You may have any. Am I on? Yeah. Nice talk. Um, I have two questions for you. Well, uh, I have a question relative to two challenges that wheat breeding face faces right now. Uh, how informative do you predict these markers can become in a predictive way as we face a uh, challenges that will come from the consumer, like all of a sudden we've decided that gluten is a problem in wheat and we're going to have to do something about it, whether it was ever a part of breeding in the past or not. So the extent to which you could very rapidly transition to, to what a consumer demands. And two, uh, climate change, the ability to now, you know, superimpose uh, 
phenotyping or environmental transitions such that you could, you know, either integrate into your populations, you know, groupings of markers that would be predictive of change of environment, or that you could basically have a whole slew of varieties ready for, for transitioning of environment? Yeah, that's a great question. So first question on how, how quickly we can address like new consumer, whether we want to or not, right? So, uh, so, so in, in one scope, you can see, and I didn't really talk about it here, but we have like a huge amount of power to do association mapping and identify or unfavorable alleles. And we're, we're taking that approach too on this. So you think about, we have an association mapping panel of like 5,000 individuals. Um, and so you can, you can use an association mapping approach to identify the, the, the variants that are giving low volume or your, your favorite gluten profile. And so with that, you could then take very informed approaches on changing that, that gluten profile. Uh, here again, then you're back in the breeding process. So it's, it's, it's not like you can turn this ship overnight and next year produce a different variety. Um, with that, and then the second question on predicting new environments or future unforeseen environments, that's a much bigger challenge. We're not that good at, at predicting G by E yet, partly because we don't really know like what the heck is G by E, especially in the sense of like, um, what's an un, okay, let me, let me back up. If, if we know what the G by E is in the sense that we can actually define what, what the random environment is so we can do a pretty good job of predicting heat trials versus drought versus like fully irrigated but if it's like in kansas where we're trying to predict from like 2013 to 2014 where it was like the warmest and then the coldest spring on record then i yeah i don't we're like really bad at that and i don't know how we go about that either so. Question on your on one slide, you you have about a thousand in your advanced yield trials. Yeah. And if you back up to that slide, I think yeah. Right there. Yep. And yep. Uh, you have a preliminary trial, and then in your uh, genomic selection, you compared uh, just using the phenot when you're only going to select a thousand, you compared just genotyping two thousand, uh, or phenotyping two thousand. Yeah. Yeah. For 50%. Then yeah. you went to 10,000. So what you're saying there is you're conducting the quality trait analysis on the, in the preliminary trial group? So, no. So, so I should have clarified that a little bit. So the flow of the SIMIT program is that there's 10,000 in that preliminary yield trial. From that, about 1,500 are selected based on agronomics and yield, and those go to the quality testing lab. And then about 1,000 are advanced into that advanced yield trial. And so, so on the genomic side, we're actually genotyping those 10,000 at this point. So, so in the current projects, we're, we're genotyping all 10,000 of those. So these are actually, all of this is, is, is currently implemented. Yeah. Jesse, quick question for you then. When you're doing your genomic selection, you know, you use the model of having a thousand lines phenotype for quality. You actually phenotype 1,500, is that? Well, I put in, so we gave it the benefit of the doubt and we said we could phenotype 2,000, which is actually more than we can phenotype. Well, that, that's okay, but my, my point was, because you're actually making a genomic selection, because you're actually conservative on it. Yeah, we're giving the phenotype the benefit of the doubt. But the point I was going to ask is, you sort of said you did in the thousand. Were you actually using the full 1500s, or you're using the ones that got selected for medical quality, as well as the 500? Yeah, we we used that entire set. So there, so so like I had on the that previous slide, there's there's somewhere between 800 to 1500 that go to the quality lab, and only a, only about, and really the selection intensity is about like. 60 percent because from 1500 like a thousand go on we we use that entire um, we use that entire set and partly you can see that the heritabilities are still on these really good and these are well into advanced testing which clearly tells you that there hasn't been any selection for quality 
uh, through through the through the program up to that point because the genetic variance is still really high. The interesting thing was the, the comment about heritabilities and predictions of mutant asymptotically or heritability is your test weight. Because test weight is such an easy yeah. very, very low C V, which means that you've really got a problem, as you described earlier, a very narrow pool of very few test weight. Yeah, so that's the two things. So, so the so the predictions that are lower than you than you might guess, and the heritabilities on test weight, I think I remember, are lower too, and and that's because test weight and thousand kernel weight, there there is several rounds of visual selection on the seed quality on the like on the seed characteristics. So, even though you have probably like a selection accuracy of like 0 0.05, <laughs> when you go from like a million down to down to to ten thousand, you, you still do make some progress. On, on something like thousand kernel weight. So yeah, so that that those are some traits that are that have been selected by the time you get to this point. My question is you have this array of traits that you have this information on is how do you weight those traits in making Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> so 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 I'm I'm on the genetics and the genomic side, so I don't weight the traits. That's like the breeder can take care of that. So, uh, so we, we got that question a lot of times, and w when we put this in for review, they said, well, you need to come up with, a, with an index and then calculate your accuracy on the index. And in reality, that's the, the CIMIC program doesn't even do it that way. They measure individual traits, and then depending on what quality profile you're going for, then they actually get w weighted independently. And some of these are more like a, like a base threshold. And then some of them are actually like like on the mix on the mixing time it's actually an intermediate threshold you don't want it too you don't want it too long you don't want it too short and so it's um, it's the art of breeding right so we just predict the traits just like the phenotyping. We have a question online from Mark Searles. Has Simit implemented genomic selection for quality? What's that? Has Simit implemented genomic selection for yeah, quality? Yeah, so starting. Um, but here again, it's it's a bit difficult to quantify. So so we made the full predictions starting last year, which would have been the 2014-15 the nurseries. So we made the full predictions. So last year we were up and running. We made the predictions on like 9,500 of the preliminary um, uh, of whatever, whatever that that set of 10,000. We made the predictions on those last year, and so Ravi used that information along with his uh, with 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 his with the agronomics and all of the other selection criteria to advance those so i think we can i think we can say yes it's uh we're here again it's a difficult once once you put this into practice in the program it's difficult to quantify um, so. Good. Good. Well, we have a small gift for you. thank you for Good. coming